Library. My name is Scott Burton. I'm the Programs Manager here. And thank you all for coming out uh, this evening to see our good friend Lee Pollock. I think this is the fourth year. So this is the fourth year Lee has spoke during the summer at the Community Library. So we're now calling an annual Churchill Lecture. Uh, this year's lecture is entitled Winston Churchill and the Civil War. Uh, Lee is visiting from Chicago where he's the Executive Director of the Churchill Center. Um, and before I give him the stage, um, I thought I'd take the opportunity um, to read a poem. At the beginning of these lectures, we like to highlight uh, something from our collection. Um, and I saw someone on social media recently describe this summer as a hellish summer, and I thought that was uh, apt. I, uh, I like to think what uh, statesmen like Churchill would have said about things like Brexit um, and the civil unrest that we've seen. Uh, in this country over this summer. Um, when <coughs> things happen in the world that are of uh, unsavory nature, I like to, I, I always cling to literature and poetry. Um, and one of those, uh, one poet I really, I really look to in these times is the Irish poet Seamus Heaney, who wrote quite extensively about the troubles in Northern Ireland. Um, and I strongly recommend checking checking out his 1995 Nobel lecture uh, entitled Crediting Poetry, which speaks to uh, poetry and literature's ability to help us try to understand these uh, things happening in our world. Um, there's a few phrases from that uh, talk that I thought are apt. Uh, he uses the phrase world spasms at one point, and another point he uses the phrase wounded spots on the face of the earth. And I feel like this summer there's been a lot of world spasms and there are a lot of wounded spots on the face of the earth. Um, and this poem that I'm going to read tonight, I think, sort of speaks to those notions. Uh, the title of the poem is Chorus from the Curate Troy. Um, and I'm read that poem, and then I uh, will bring Lee up here to give his annual church home lecture. So this is uh, Chorus from the Curate Troy by Seamus Heaney. Human beings suffer, they torture one another. They get hurt and get hard. No poem or play or song can fully right a wrong inflicted and endured. The innocents in jails beat on their bars together. A hunger striker's father stands in the graveyard dumb. The police widow in veils faints at the funeral home. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed-for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that further shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracle and cures and healing wells. Call miracle self-healing, the utter self-revealing double take of feeling. If there's fire on the mountain or lightning and storm, and a God speaks from the sky, that means someone is hearing the outcry and the birth cry of new life to its term. Please join me in welcoming Lee Pollock back to the Community Library. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. It's always a pleasure to be back here at the Community Library. As Scott mentioned, this is the fourth year I've had the pleasure of speaking here about the life and times of Winston Churchill. As some of you may remember, we began this series in 2013 with Franklin and Winston, the friendship that saved the world, where we looked at the all-important relationship between Churchill and Roosevelt as they struggled to defeat the twin evils of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. Our next and somewhat later subject was at Churchill's table, dining and diplomacy with history's greatest leaders, where we, where we learned how Churchill used personal diplomacy throughout his life to advance his political objectives. And last year, we talked about Churchill and the Jews, which explored the lifelong relationship between Winston Churchill and the Jewish people, the emergence of Zionism, and the catastrophe of the Holocaust. One thing I want to promise you tonight is that not a single word of what I'm about to say was taken from a speech by Michelle Obama. <laughs> Our subject tonight is Churchill and the Civil 
I mentioned this title to one of my Sun Valley friends recently who commented, the Civil War, of course, the one where Oliver Cromwell chopped off King Charles's head. And I said, no, the American Civil War. The response was, what's that got to do with Winston Churchill? He wasn't even American. Well, Churchill was actually half American by birth, and some of his critics thought there were too many American qualities in his personality. During the 1930s, one of those critics, the conservative politician and supporter of appeasement, Rab Butler, called Churchill, quote, a half-breed American. That was not a compliment. But even though Churchill was born and lived in Britain off his entire life, he knew a tremendous amount about the Civil War and wrote and spoke about it frequently. More importantly, his interest in and fascination with that conflict deeply influenced his understanding of America and the American people. We can learn a lot about great figures of history through lesser known vignettes of their personality. And while the Civil War was but one of Churchill's many interests and passions, it does provide an intriguing window into how we thought about history, war, and politics, which were the central preoccupations of his life. There's one more question I'd like to ask before we get to the topic of this evening. Someone back home in Chicago asked me, why do you keep giving talks at that little community library way out in Idaho? <laughs> I said the short answer, short answer is, they keep on inviting me. <laughs> but there's another more personal reason. We have two kids, one just graduated from college and one a junior, who are pleased that they're excellent students. And one reason for that is that they're good readers. And that, in turn, is because they learn to read in the children's section here at this library. I don't have to tell you what a vital role this library plays in the life of the Wood River Valley through its wonderful collection and outstanding programs, and that it receives no public money. Don't clap yet, there's a pitch coming. So if you enjoy the talk tonight, go donate online or with the forms um, that are available at the front desk, or even take some cash out of your pocket and give it to Scott. He'll be slightly embarrassed, but he will give you a receipt. And it is a very good cause. And now on to Churchill and the Civil War. It's been just a year since we commemorated the 50th anniversary of Churchill's death and the 150th anniversary of the end of the Civil War. So it's a good time to take up this subject. History is always more enjoyable and more interesting when it involves a good story. So let's start with this. It's a fall evening in the governor's mansion in Richmond, Virginia, October 1929. The governor is the legendary Harry Byrd Sr., arguably the most successful, both as governor and later US senator, politician in the history of the state. The occasion is a formal dinner for a distinguished British visitor who has just arrived to stay with the Byrd family. What happened next was retold over 60 years later by the governor's then 14-year-old son, Harry Byrd Jr., who incidentally grew up to be a pretty successful politician in his own right. Young Byrd was standing at the bottom of the mansion's grand staircase, along with a grown-up cousin. The cousin was to join the dinner and so was in a tuxedo. The distinguished guests bounded down the stairs without even a hello to either of them. Apparently mistaking the cousin for a butler, he turned and said briskly, my man, fetch me a newspaper. The startled reply was, of course, sir. So the cousin and young bird ran down the street to the Richmond Hotel a block away and quickly returned with that day's news leader newspaper. They were rewarded with a 25 cent tip and kept that quarter the rest of their lives. <laughs> Virginia Ham was not surprisingly the highlight of the ensuing dinner, but there was a problem. The guest asked Mrs. Bird for some English mustard, but the kitchen had none. She reported this along with an offer, which she assumed would be graciously declined, to send someone for it. The guest quickly responded, yes, I would like that. So out went Bird Jr. again, this time to the corner store. Meanwhile, back at the mansion, the poor first lady had to slow the dinner to a crawl while waiting for the requested condiment. The British visitor was Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill, and he was a demanding guest. 
As Berg recalled, Churchill took to specifying the exact time of day he wanted breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and what he expected on the menu. And apparently he had the habit of wandering around the mansion's second floor in his underwear. When it was finally time to leave the next morning, the birds stood outside the front door, waving goodbye to their distinguished visitor. Bird Jr. recalled many years later, I remember my mother's first words to my father as Churchill's car pulled out of the driveway. Harry, don't you ever invite that man back. <laughs> the fact that Churchill could be a demanding house guest was something another first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, found out some years later when Churchill stayed in the White House for almost a month visiting President Roosevelt after Pearl Harbor. I think she sometimes felt about Churchill the way Mrs. Byrd did. So what was Winston Churchill, already one of the most famous men in Britain and the world, doing for several days in Virginia? While he was no longer in power, having lost the position of Chancellor of the Exchequer in the British <coughs> in May of that year, he was certainly still a busy man. A visit to what was then a relatively quiet southern state might have seemed unexpected. Churchill, in fact, was on the last stage of a several-month coast-to-coast tour of America. He had come to the United States for two reasons. First, he recognized the power of America, even in a time of isolationism, and its importance to the future of the world. Secondly, he, deliver he delivered a raft of paid lectures to large audiences across the country. In addition to wanting to share his view of world issues, there was another simple reason for doing that. Always overspending and without the free housing and salary of the chancellorship, he badly needed the money. It didn't help that he was about to sustain massive losses by rash speculation in the US stock market, which would begin crashing down mere weeks later. Churchill wanted to give the state of Virginia his full attention because of his lifelong fascination with history with the United States and with America's greatest conflict, the Civil War. Let's talk about that fascination, how it came about, what it meant to him, and what he said about the war. Churchill was born in 1874, only nine years after the end of the war, which was a fresh and vivid memory around the world. His father, Lord Randolph Churchill, had been a teenager during the conflict, and the four years it lasted was big news in Britain. The spectacle of this great English-speaking republic, less than a century old, still with many ties to its former mother country, but now tearing itself apart, was followed with consuming interest. In many ways, it was the first modern industrial war, a war of attrition, and a long way from the more traditional combat of the Napoleonic era. And sentiment in Britain about the war was deeply divided. While slavery had been abolished in the British Empire in 1833, support for the South was strong, and the Confederates tried vigorously to fan that. At various points, friction between Britain and the Union threatened to lead to direct involvement in the conflict on the southern side. Of course, that didn't happen, but what a game changer that could have been. It was natural that Churchill would gravitate to the history of the United States, as his mother was the Brooklyn-born Jenny Jerome, the daughter of a wealthy New York financier named Leonard Jerome, who was a vehement supporter of the Union. Jerome was part owner of the New York Times, and during that city's vicious draft riots in 1863, personally fought off a mob attempting to torch the Times office. The Times had been targeted because it was well known to be a leading supporter of the Republican Party. <coughs> I understand that's not the case anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jenny Jerome looking at her most beautiful. <laughs> Churchill grew up through cartoons of the Civil War in the satirical magazine Punch, and at age 12 in 1887, wrote to his mother, quote, my birthday is drawing near. I should rather like a copy of General Grant's illustrated history of the American Civil War. The Civil War was the subject of his entrance examination when he applied to the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst three years later. 
There he came under the influence of a leading British historian of the war, Professor G.F. Henderson, and began to read more about it. He quickly concluded it was, quote, the most interesting of all the wars in which I have read. These are samples of a couple of the cartoons in Punch about the Civil War. After graduating in 1895, Churchill visited America for the first time. There he told his New York host about a fascinating new book that had become highly popular in Britain, but was as yet little read in the United States. It was Stephen Crane's classic, The Red Badge of Courage. Like Crane's hero, young Churchill was already dreaming of battles to come. <clears throat> Churchill was a fast rising star in the House of Commons after his election in 1900 and soon was in the cabinet. <clears throat> As military rivalries between Britain and Germany and between the Reich, France, and Russia intensified, Churchill looked to the Civil War 